Good evening. Welcome to our webinar on Mona Lisa Touch and female health. Um, I'm your host, Louise King, and our consultant gynaecologist this evening are Miss Anna Zakharyan and Mr. Rowan Connell. So welcome. Um, this session will be a presentation first from Anna and then from Rowan, and then we'll have a Q&A session. You can, however, ask questions throughout by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we, you can, we can, we'll answer your questions at the end. You can do this with or without giving your name. And just to note, this session is being recorded. So if you, you do give your name, your name will be noticed by others. However, we will be able to get back to you afterwards with questions if we, and answers if we haven't managed to get through them. Um, at the end of this session, we have a lovely private patient advisor on the end of the phone called Sarah, who better book an appointment if you wish to do so. Um, and we'll provide the phone number at the end. And um, I think that's everything. So I will now hand over to Ms. Sakharyan. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Good, uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. As you all are aware, there is an increased awareness about, um, oh, sorry, that's about me. So I'm graduated abroad, but the, ticked all the necessary boxes in here. MRCOG member, and I'm specializing in general gynecology, bleeding disorders, vulval problems, contraception, HRT, fibroids, and vaginal prolapse. So uh, there is an increased uh, um, interest in postmenopausal woman health these days, and we just decided we'll uh, give you this webinar just to improve your knowledge and understanding of the issue and changes and treatment necessary for that. So vulvovaginal vaginal health in postmenopausal women. Age-related changes in women can result in an increased occurrence of vulvovaginal vaginal dermatological conditions, such as vulval dermatitis, lichen sclerosis, along with associated issues such as incontinence, recurrent urinary tract infection, and sexual dysfunction. Atrophic changes during and after menopause due to declining estrogen levels can result in a range of symptoms, including vaginal dryness, irritation, increased susceptibility to trauma and infection. Vulvovaginal vaginal atrophy is the, is the, this, this is the term used for vulvovaginal vulvo vaginal changes after menopause. It occurs due to decreasing estrogen levels. Estrogen is the primary hormone that regulates the physiology of the vulvovaginal tissue. As a woman ages, the progressive decline in circulating estradiol, which begins in perimenopausal period, results in a number of changes that can affect the health of the whole genital urinary tract. There is an increased sensitivity of vulvovaginal skin, progressive estrogen deficiency, and the close proximity of urethral opening as well as the anus, combined with the skin changes due to aging, make conditions affecting the vulvovaginal skin common and cause a lot of distress uh, for postmenopausal women. Uh, changes that occur with aging and decreasing estrogen levels include atrophy of vulval tissue, thinning of the skin, atrophy of subcutaneous fat, the decreased hair growth. There is atrophy of the vagina, narrowing and shortening of the vagina with construction of the introitus. The lining of the vagina tends to become thinner, less elastic, and smoother due to decrease in rugal folds. Atrophy of all other estrogen-dependent tissues, pelvic low muscles, urethral mucosa, uterus, ovaries. There is ongoing decreased vascularity, decreased vaginal secretion, which uh, contributes to alteration in the vaginal microflora and changing of the pH, which is responsible for maintaining appropriate levels of so-called lactobacilli, which are responsible for, again, self-cleaning um, and maintaining of normal vaginal flora. So vulvovaginal atrophy is the term that is used to describe these specific atrophic changes. It progressively occurs in all women after menopause. Uh, it is considered as a condition by itself because of these characteristic changes due to decreasing estrogen and can result in the characteristic symptoms such as vaginal dryness, irritation, discomfort, uh, and that makes vulvovaginal skin more vulnerable to trauma and infection. So the other uh, vulvovaginal conditions that become more common after menopause, as you can see them listed on a screen, uh, there are, they are vulval dermatitis, lichen sclerosis, less frequently like complainers and 
Lichen simplex may occur in postmenopausal women, but it's more frequent in younger women. Uh, the pattern of symptoms, though, of all these conditions can be often very similar. The majority of women presenting with an itch to be the primary symptom. And non specific nature of this presenting symptom sometimes makes it very difficult to distinguish between the various conditions involved. And in some women, one condition can present simultaneously with the others or develop on the background of underlying dermatological condition, such as psoriasis. Uh, atrophy of estrogen-dependent tissues uh, can contribute to other gynecological problems, uh, including uterine prolapse, urinary incontinence, and recurrent urinary tract infections. Women who are postmenopausal may also continue to have problems with candidiasis and bacterial vaginosis without the infections uh, related to valva vagina. For various reasons, sexually transmitted infections are not often considered as a diagnosis in older women. However, many postmenopausal women remain sexually active, and actually they are higher risk of STIs due to increased susceptibility to infection and lack of condom use, particularly if the woman is in the new uh, relationship. And it, uh, women can also have concerns about their sexual function, which is caused by affected valve vaginal atrophy and skin conditions. It, women usually are very reluctant to talk about valve vaginal problems. It is difficult consultation to be started with anyone. And it is estimated that only 25, 50% of women with these symptoms seek help from their GPs. And the research did show that women finding it embarrassing, uncomfortable, private matter, they uh, believe that it's a normal part of getting older. They are not aware of the treatment available, and they simply don't know how to initiate a conversation about all of these issues. But hence the increased um, uh, topics and uh, widespread uh, knowledge information just to acknowledge that those changes are happening. They are expected part of aging, and initiation of conversation is very important for understanding and better compliance with the treatments. So um, management of common conditions. So for valve vaginal atrophy, I think we are a bit behind with the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy include irritation, vaginal dryness, dysuria, other urinary symptoms, dyspareunia, which is the pain on intercourse, and can have abnormal vaginal discharge. Atrophic vaginitis is the term often used when inflammation accompanies all this changing, and that results in a patchy redness and tenderness in the vaginal introitus. In the woman with vulvovaginal atrophy without inflammation, the tissue tend to be thin, pale, and dry. Fissuring of the posterior fourchette, which is the margin of the skin fold, which forms the margin of the vagina, is, could be very often seen on the attempt of having intercourse or a basic vaginal examination. So the local estrogen treatment is usually the preferred treatment option rather than oral or transdermal estrogen treatment, when the sole aim of the treatment is just the relief of vulvovaginal symptom. Treatment with topical estrogen, estriol cream or pessaris, is regarded as safe and effective. The initial advice should be that it uh, applied uh, daily in the evening until the symptoms improved. Usually that takes two to three weeks and then reduce the application to one evening twice a week. There is no need for a progesterone backup for this treatment. Patient, uh, it is important to know for patients that initially application of this cream can cause some burning, but that usually improves within the two weeks of use. A non-estrogen containing vaginal moisturizers can be used as well, bioadhesive gel, 
they may be used in the conjunction with a topical estrogen, but they are less effective in the relieving of symptoms on their own. Water-based uh, vaginal lubricants may be required to, again, help with dryness and friction-related trauma, especially during sexual intercourse. Uh, it is important to note that even those gels can cause some stinking and burning on the initial use. Next slide, please. One of the other conditions is a utero-vaginal prolapse. Women uh, of perimenopausal and postmenopausal may represent with the symptoms due to pelvic organ prolapse. The symptoms include dragging sensation in a pelvis, urinary incontinence, difficulties with micturition or defecation. Examination will usually establish some lump or bulging in the vaginal wall due to prolapse of the uterus, bladder wall, rectum wall, or even the cervix. In the women who had hysterectomy, it could be a vault. Depending on the stage of prolapse, some of it may even extend through the introitus with straining. Treatment option includes pelvic floor exercises, which should at least minimum be three to four months, and it is best uh, um, better to have it guided by physiotherapist, topical estrogen, use of vaginal ring pessary or surgery. Next slide, please. Vulval dermatitis. In postmenopausal women is more likely to be caused on the contact due to some irritants such as soap, fragrances, overwashing, urine, and uh, this is on an affected area. They cause the inflammation of the skin, which is often aggravated by the atrophy and can cause itch, burning, and nonspecific irritation. The clinical findings on examination may vary. A woman with mild dermatitis will have mild redness, swelling, and scaling of the affected area, whereas uh, with a severe dermatitis, the, the skin may be markedly red, swollen, with obvious erosions and ulcerations. Uh, and it is important in those cases to have these areas biopsied. Initial management obviously will be the avoidance of these irritants and use of emollients. Low potency corticosteroids such as 1% hydrocortisone can be trialed to reduce the inflammation. In women with a severe itch, an oral sedating antihistamine or antidepressants may be required at night. Uh, if there is a matter of suspicion of an infection, which can be due to discharge or smell, swabs will need to be taken uh, and treated appropriately. The use of topical estrogen can increase in those cases uh, candida infection, which is not that common in a postmenopausal women. Next condition is a lichen simplex. Uh, lipan simplex arises as a result of excessive scratching and rubbing of an area affected by an underlying condition, such as dermatitis, or it could be neuropathic pruritus, which is itchiness. This leads to lichenification of hair-bearing skin, usually on the labia majora or perineum, where the skin becomes thickened with increased skin markings and follicular prominence. Lichen simplex is itself intensely itchy and causes a lot of excoriations, broken hair. Uh, it characterizes in each scratch, each cycle, with symptoms often worse at night or aggravated by heat, humidity, soap, or the presence of a urine. Sometimes there might be also some burning and pain. Um, Simplex can occur anywhere on the body, but the vulval area is one of the commonest affected areas. On the vulva, lichen simplex can be localized to one area or be widespread, but um, it doesn't affect hairless areas or mucosas. Management, again, goes down to uh, managing the itch and allowing healing of the area. Uh, so it first of all needs to identify the condition, manage the condition that caused the primary itch, uh, dermatitis, uh, identify the irritant allergen. Um, neuropathic pruritus could be due to pudental nerve entrapment or radiculopathy, and that can explain the symptoms if no um, other irritant or dermatosis is identified. 
So oral antihistamines, as I've mentioned, or low dose tricyclic antidepressants at night, required to break this each scratch, each cycle to assist with sleep and healing. Uh, potent topical corticosteroids in this case will need to be um, applied. Better metazone ointment to be advised once daily to the thickened skin to reduce the lichenification. Um, and then gradually it, um, frequency needs to be reduced uh, until the symptoms fully resolved, usually four to six weeks after daily use. If the treatment with betamethasone ointment doesn't appear to be beneficial enough, stronger corticosteroids can be prescribed, such as uh, clobetazole ointment uh, should be used daily um, only by the specialist, preferably after diagnosis has been confirmed. In addition, simple things can be applied, such as cool packs, uh, emollients to reduce dryness and itch. Uh, erosions and fissures can be caused by scratching and they can predispose to secondary infection. That would require treatment with antibiotics. Uh, treatment sometimes can be uh, quite complex and long-term, but usually the result in the resolution of the symptoms. When it becomes chronic and causes significant uh, distress, antidepressants are important to, again, allowing some break through nice night, uh, allowing some sleep and some time for it to heal. Lichen sclerosis is one of the commonest conditions and commonest presentation to gynae clinic. Uh, of postmenopausal women with a vulval conditions. It's an inflammatory skin disorder thought to be of autoimmune origin, but uh, obviously influenced by genes, hormones, irritants, infections. It can occur in women of any age, but it's most common in the women over age 50. It primarily affects the hairless vulva, perineal, perianal skin, doesn't involve the vagina itself. Uh, only long-standing disease can involve labia majora and even spread uh, further. Approximately 10% of women with vulvar lichen sclerosis will also have non-genital areas of skin affected, and 20% may have another autoimmune diseases such as thyroid dysfunction, vitiligo, psoriasis, or anemia. The most common symptom in a woman with lichen sclerosis is severe itch though women can also be asymptomatic. They com may complain of pain uh, aggravated by development of fissures secondary to scratching, friction from sexual intercourse. Chronic one can cause distortion of genital anatomy, including adhesions, uh, fusion of labia, partial or full, narrowing of the vaginal introitus, causing significant dyspareunia, which is pain on intercourse, uh, obviously aggravated by all postmenopausal changes from atrophy and loss of elasticity. Scarring and fissure development around the anus can cause pain and bleeding and aggravate constipation. On examination, the affected area of the skin may appear white, thickened, and there might be some petechia and purpura, which are reddish and uh, purple spots. Scratching, again, can result in fissure formation and secondary infection. So a treatment by a specialist is more recommended, especially in some cases when there is active ulceration, biopsy would be required. It's not always easy to distinguish lichen sclerosis from any other condition affecting the valve area. And again, biopsy is quite differential in this case. It's very rarely curable although can usually be improved. So a long-term plan of management is essential. It can be associated with the development of a vulval, vulval intraepithelial neoplasia, so-called VIN, which is very similar to CIN, and invasive squamous cell carcinoma with an incidence of approximately 5%. So ideally, these valves, affected valves, will need to be checked annually or more often if there is an additional symptoms.
Treatment again with uh, ultra potent topical corticosteroid ointment, such as betamethasone or clobetazone, at night to the affected areas up to three months. It is aimed at reducing symptoms to a tolerable level. And um, the duration of the daily treatment will depend on the severity and the response to the treatment. The frequency of application can gradually be reduced to once symptoms have begun to settle. More limited use of a potent or ultra-potent corticosteroid is recommended in a women when lichal sclerosis is affecting the anal area. It's usually recommended no longer than two weeks. The Majority of these women with the valvular lichen sclerosis also should be treated with intravaginal estrogen cream. The response can be quite variable. Um, each can improve within a few days, but the appearance of the skin returning to normal may take weeks or even months. So uh, maintenance treatment is very important. Women should understand that they will have to continue the treatment for a very long time to prevent and reduce possibility of the scarring. If scarring has already occurred, this is not reversible with corticosteroids. If there is a narrowing of the vaginal introitus, the use of dilators can be trialed. These are progressively used starting from a smaller size and increased to a bigger size as they are tolerated. Surgery may be required in the cases where there is a partial or even full fusion of the labias, especially if there is a problem with micturition. And the, the vaginal dilators didn't resolve the problems. I will not be talking about any other conditions. There are a few of them like complainers, seborrheic dermatitis or malignant changes. They are not as common. And um, anything beyond these simple uh, situations will require referral to specialists where it can be assessed and um, managed accordingly. I just would like to touch one more thing, sexual health for older women. That's another hot topic that is usually addressed in the general practice. Uh, and usually the talk about it is limited to uh, excluding sexually transmitting infections. But in uh, women of older age, it's um, assessing their sexual functioning and generally well-being associated with that. Sexual response and what is considered normal varies from person to person. In general, a sexual health dysfunction should be only considered a problem if it causes distress to the person or their partner. For example, vaginal dryness or loss of libido may not be an issue for a woman who is not sexually active. However, if the woman meets a new partner, this may become something that she will need help for. So the problems, uh, sexual problems for older women may include loss of libido, and that can be improved with a medication and the counseling. Vaginal discomfort and dryness, as I've mentioned, can be significantly improved with lubricants, use of topical estrogen, valval vaginal pain. Uh, again, the recommendation of lubricants, pelvic floor exercising, incontinence uh, should be managed accordingly and um, with the modifying factors, uh, recommending incontinence wear and pelvic floor exercises. Sometimes, due to comorbidities and uh, medications, this can affect the sexual function by reducing the libido. So the, if it's possible, the medication should be reconsidered or the dose reduced to help the situation. It mainly relates to antidepressants. It, social factors can play a big role in um, causing sexual problems. And that's the next slide saying about uh, lack of privacy, say in a residential care setting, uh, self-esteem issues, which will require some counseling and uh, talking, coping strategies, relationship issues um, with a new partner, pressure to have sex, again, encourage discussion, consider referral for counseling, 
and uh, generally uh, knowledge about the whole problem, especially knowledge about STIs, uh, appropriate protection and uh, treatment if required. So uh, there is a website attached, which has been used as a main uh, backup for this information. I will now allow my colleague, Mr. Cornell, to take the subject further and help and discuss how he can improve the sexual life with the treatment he provides. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yep, great. Um, so I'm also a consultant gynecologist at Benenden, um, and I specialize in urogyne, which is prolapse and incontinence, and vaginal and pelvic floor reconstruction surgery. Um, and with Dr. Zacharyan at Benenden, we offer a menopause service as well. Um, and thank you very much for allowing me to just touch on Mona Lisa Touch, um, which is a sort of continuation of what Anna was talking about. Um, and we've had quite a lot of people who've asked for a little bit more information about it. And as Anna said, it's a very private and um, difficult thing to, for some people to talk about. And a lot of GPs are also a little bit reluctant to talk about it. So essentially, the Mona Lisa is a, is a non-hormonal laser treatment um, for the prevention or treatment of the symptoms, a lot of which Anna's talked about. And it's really about vaginal dryness in the menopause. And as she said, it affects at least 40% of menopausal women. And what we found with the Mona Lisa is that we're also seeing some women after they've had their babies, and especially young women who've had chemotherapy for breast cancer, the newer uh, tablets and so forth, the breast cancer treatments are very anti-estrogenic. And a lot of these problems are because of the lack of estrogen. Um, I've just said, you know, what, what is it for? Well, it's for vaginal dryness, vaginal itchiness, burning, etc. A lot of work is being done also into bladder weakness, so urinary incontinence. Um, I'm still slightly nervous about um, selling it as a, um, a great treatment for urinary incontinence, but it, almost every woman we've seen with some bladder issues has noticed an improvement. And Anna mentioned lichen sclerosis. We've also seen that this can help with treatment of lichen sclerosis. And of course, it's because it's mimicking in a lot of ways the estrogen effects. Um, what I've put down here as well is it's not. The Mona Lisa is not for vaginal tightening. Um, and this is a, a very low power laser compared to the higher powered lasers that people will sell for laser tightening. So that's a, a sort of laser treatment rather than having vaginal repairs. And you will have heard uh, conditions like genital urinary symptoms of the menopause. Um, just very briefly um, from the history, it started in, in Milan in 2012, and it was noted that uh, this low power laser was used on burns on the faces. And Salvatore, uh, or Stefano Salvatore, um, used it on a very bad scar on the vagina of the lady that had a baby and noticed an improvement on that. And so since then, he's been pushing that, and I got my training in Milan in, in uh, 2014 15. And we brought the laser to Bend in 2017, and we've been treating women since then. And as I said, it's a very low power laser treatment. Um, we now treat the inside of the vagina and the outside um, because it sort of seems to balance the treatment. And of course, it's non hormonal. So, in women who can't take hormones like the estrogen and the gels and the creams that Anna was mentioning, or they don't want to try it, or they feel there's a, um, a contraindication, for example, if they've very recently had breast cancer, then the Mona Lisa is one of the only things that we can use to help after all the emollients and the creams that Anna's been mentioning. Um, I put this up because when Stefano wrote his paper, he's put down symptom improvement. Um, what I tend to say to people is that everybody will improve so rather than saying 84% improvement, um, what I say is that everybody has improved, but I can't tell you how much the improvement will be. And so some women will have very minor improvement and some will have a huge amount of improvement. And it's very variable 
in how different women respond to that. And of course, the symptoms that Anna's been mentioning are the burning, the itching, the dryness, and of course, painful intercourse. Um, he put down the feeling of laxity, and that's the sort of thinness in the vagina and the lack of fat that you quite often get after the menopause. And when you thicken up the skin, that feeling of laxity can improve. Um, the machine itself is this little, little box. It's like a very small filing cabinet. And what it does, it stimulates the cells in the skin of the vagina and on the outside when we treat that. And the collagen in that is changed into a, uh, the easiest way of putting it is a younger collagen, so more elastic and less brittle. And it also thickens the skin by increasing the skin production. The procedure itself is in outpatients um, in a specialized private room, a little bit like when you have colposcopy or an examination. Uh, the treatment itself takes about five minutes. And most importantly, there are three sessions which are approximately six weeks apart. So some women will notice a huge improvement after the first treatment and less after the second and third. And other women will have very little improvement after the first and second and a bigger improvement after the third. But it is important with the data that we've got that you have those three treatments. And possibly if the, the symptoms um, recur or you get deterioration after the improvements, you may need a top up, which is one top up somewhere between a year and two after the treatment starts. I use an awful lot of estrogen in the vagina, as Anna mentioned. So I use Vagifem, which is a little pessary, like a, a lozenge or cream. Um, and when you use that in combination with the Mona Lisa, there's a bigger improvement and the, and the treatment seems to last longer. Just going on to exactly what happens, the probe itself is about the same size as your thumb. So even in women with very sore vaginas, this is fairly well tolerated. Um, the treatment itself is fires little lasers, um, which are about the same temperature as a 20 watt bulb. So you can barely feel it. And they fire little holes. And I've just shown you this dot arrangement. And you, you fire it, twist it, and pull it out a, a millimeter or two and fire it again. And, and the pattern inside the vagina is very similar to what you can see on the screen. And you can see these little measurements, which are two millimeter measurements. And that's essentially what, what happens. So it lasts about 40 goes, if you know what I mean. It's the best way I can describe it. Um, the side effects, which very rarely happen, Sometimes we have some bleeding, especially in women who've got very, very sore vaginas. And of course, because it is, in theory, a very light burn, you can get some discharge after that, which is not usually infection, but just a mild discharge. And of course, there'll be some tenderness and swelling. For the treatment itself, we give you some local anaesthetic on the skin of the outside of the vagina, because the inside of the vagina doesn't actually get affected by the, the Mona Lisa laser. So women will turn up about five or 10 minutes before their appointment, have some local anaesthetic like Emla cream when children have needles in the back of their arms, put that on, it just takes the edge off. And very rarely, because of course the, the urethra, the, the wee tube is very close to the area that we're treating. So very occasionally you can have a little bit of discomfort or irritation when you pass uh, urine. It's, the first treatment is always the worst because people don't know what to expect, but it's so well tolerated that people usually then come on their own the second time, but it's usually quite a good idea to come with a friend or a partner. What you can do um, before it is I don't, we don't recommend using any creams or the HRT cream for a day or two beforehand, because we ideally want as little product inside the vagina as possible. And certainly afterwards, we don't recommend much exercising for two or three days, because if the vagina is sore and then you're running and swimming and exercising, it'll cause some, some friction and some more discomfort. And those exercises are the worst are swimming, running, cycling. Um, we don't recommend sex um, for a week or so after the treatment. Um, and as far as driving is concerned, uh, a few minutes after the procedure, uh, most people are quite happy to drive except for the first time when you'll be you'll have some anxiety about it 
So hopefully that's um, just going to be a very brief overlay of what the Mona Lisa is about. And um, I think that Louise will take over for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan and Anna. OK, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, I am 30 and have bad periods that are really affecting my life. Would I be eligible for a hysterectomy? Anna, do you want to go with that or? So, um, well, it's not directly related question. It's she's 30 years of age and she has bad periods. Well, yes. it's a difficult question to answer without any detailed history. There are a lot of parameters involved before making any final decision, it will take a lot of discussions, needs to know exact details of the periods, which aspect of it bothersome, what treatment has been applied yet. And um, unfortunately in this country, hysterectomy cannot be considered if treatments leading towards have been tried, attempted and failed. And there are so many less invasive, less destructive options to be considered before hysterectomy, but again, woman's choice is always considered uh, and applied, given the circumstances, obviously. It, it's not a question for yes or no. Mm -hmm. I agree, and we, we do have protocols in place for women of any age, and we have to go through various treatments first, I agree. Thank you. Okay, um, this one's for you, Rowan. Um, this lady is 57, and she thinks Mona Lisa Touch would be ideal for her. Um, she's always been quite hesitant, though, to have clinical treatment. Are there any serious risks during or after the treatment? Yeah, as I said, the, we, we've had very few problems. Um, we've had one or two ladies that have had a little bit of bleeding after the first treatment and one lady that had some bleeding after the second treatment, but it's very minor. Um, I suppose it's impossible to say there's no risk, but certainly discomfort, pain, bleeding are the other side effects. Um, but it's a very, very well tolerated procedure. Um, we've been doing it, as I said, since 2017. So we've had uh, quite a lot of ladies that are coming back for their second or third treatments now. As I said, the when it works really well, if you use the, the estrogen creams and pessaries afterwards, you can sometimes delay the treatment, the second treatment for one or two years. But we've had quite a few ladies coming back. Okay. So I'd say... Side effects, not uh, clinical problems, really. Okay, thank you. Um, Anna, this lady um, is asking, can the tropical estrogens be used if someone has dermoid cysts, which appear to be getting bigger when scanned randomly? I, the to, uh, estrogen, topical creams, did you mention? Estrogen creams, yes. yes. Can they be used? I, I, they should not have a direct impact on a dermoid. Dermoid is not considered to be hormone sensitive. So if there is an enlargement in the size on the subsequent scans, I will suggest it to be uh, tested further and maybe considered for a removal. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rowan, um, uh, this lady is considering Mona Lisa Touch and has she tried creams and herbal remedies already? Is this the best laser treatment for vaginal atrophy or are there other lasers used for this type of treatment? Yeah, there's three or four different types of lasers out there. Um, we went for the Mona Lisa because in my view, well, A, I helped develop it and Salvatore gave us all the information for nearly a decade now. Uh, it's also low power lasered. Um, and when some of these treatments were being done in the late so 2008 2009 people were using quite high powered lasers and that to me is not what we're doing this for the high powered lasers tend to burn and scar so um, they can be used for for example as i said urinary incontinence to tighten up the collagen um, but i don't use any other treatments and we looked at another laser and again i don't think the data is particularly good but of course, I'm biased because I love the Mona Lisa and I think the, the data and the results we've got are very, very good. So I'm not going to completely disrespect the other lasers, but we looked into it quite heavily uh, five or six years ago and thought that the Mona Lisa was the best. But well, there, are treat there are other treatments available. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to back up um, Mr. Connell on this. I think that's the one that is widely used by gynecologists other than plastic surgeons and for plastic purposes. I think that's the commonly used one, the wider used one, hmm. with a better data available. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. Okay, um, this lady has suffered with many menopausal symptoms over the past 10 years. Her doctors dismissed the idea of her using HRT as there's a history of blood clots in the family. Would it be safe for her to try HRT, the HRT gel now at the age of 60? This for you, Anna. Um, again, um, obviously ongoing problem for at least 10 years. It will take a deeper discussion and understanding of the problem family history usually the risks associated with HRT increase every decade. It is not recommended to be started so far after the menopause. The risk of increasing clot um, is still there, even with a gel or patch. And I usually normally would advise to consider non-hormonal management options first, because there are alternatives available before embarking on something so risky that can be potentially causing problem that can be life-threatening, why not to try something less invasive, safer option? Okay, thank you. Um, for Mona Lisa Touch, you mentioned the treatment itself is very short. Will they be in pain afterwards and how long does it take to fully recover? Um, okay, so the... As I said, we give local anaesthetic or local anaesthetic is put on by the ladies when they come in. So very few will feel it um, because it fires off um, kind of 16, 18 little tiny lasers. Uh, you can sometimes feel that as little irritation, like like tiny, tiny pinpricks, um, generally in the skin, not in the vagina. So if you do have discomfort afterwards, and I said that was one of the side effects is bleeding it bleeding and potentially some discomfort or pain, then the women go home with local anaesthetic cream, uh, which they can then reapply. And literally we've had a handful of people that have needed that. Sometimes you'll have, um, and of course, because where Benenden is in the Southeast, uh, before COVID we were having women coming from France, the Channel Islands and Scotland. Um, but of course now we train more people, it is more widely available. Um, but women were then going home all the way to Scotland on a slightly sore vagina already and bouncing in a car or, or so on. So that can be an issue, I suppose. But as I said, the treatment itself causing problems would give you local anaesthetic. So that should take the edge off it. Thank you. Okay. Um, this lady is post-menopause and seems to have a bulging sensation and mild discomfort passing urine. They are worried that this could be a prolapse. Are these symptoms normal or should they see a kind of gynecologist? As I mentioned earlier, the symptoms are ongoing along with vulvo vaginal atrophy. Just the shrinking of the tissues can cause the sensation of dragging sensation and some sitting on something that should not be there. It can also affect the urinary function frequency, um, give them false sensation of UTI. Obviously, to rule out prolapse, the only way is the examination. And I will recommend this woman to be examined to rule out prolapse. Um, prolapse or not, uh, it is recommended to start the treatment with estrogen, topical estrogens first to eliminate some of the sensation. And as I've mentioned earlier, prolapse, uh, the treatment of the prolapse will vary depending on the stage and uh, location of the prolapse. But topical estrogens are very successful in providing the first initial treatment, and especially if there is no prolapse on examination, topical estrogens will be the first line treatment for that. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Sue asks, can, uh, can anything go wrong with the laser treatment? If so, what could that be? Um, great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not really, because it's a, as a CO2 laser, carbon dioxide laser, um, I suppose what people are worried about is it's such a low power that doesn't really cause 
any issues but of course uh, laser safety means you come in with, and you have special glasses put on and so on um, there aren't any glass wires that some of the other lasers the YAG lasers go down wires so you can see it glowing and this is all done um, within the machine so it's all covered in metal um, I didn't get that could you I, try again oh dear that's my watch speaking um, so I can't really think of anything uh, that would go wrong. We've not had any problems apart from, as I said, the slight issue behind sometimes getting some bleeding and sometimes having a bit of discomfort. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, Kay says, hi, Anna. I'm looking forward to having a hysterectomy with you later on this year. She's been reading about prolapse, however, post hysterectomy and asks, is surgery often the only answer for prolapse? If there is indeed a prolapse, um, the treatment of the prolapse, the superficial one with uh, topical estrogens, pelvic floor exercising, uh, following the guidelines these days, we have to follow the protocols as Roman said, uh, no surgery will be conducted without trying uh, proper pelvic floor exercising for at least three, four months, because there is a very good evidence that it does help a lot of symptoms. And along with a topical estrogen, if the prolapse is not bad, that may be enough, at least for some period of the time. The other treatment options are vaginal ring pessaries and come in all variety forms and shapes and sizes, can be trialed. Uh, that's to, that's considered as a conservative management, non-surgical management. And there is a surgical management Again, in all variety of ranges, depending of the location of the prolapse, the degree of the prolapse, and the surgeon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rowan, this lady suffers with vaginal dryness and usually prefers to take the most natural option. Please, could you explain the benefits of using oestrogen cream versus pessaries over coconut oil? And then be ah, coconut oil beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, she's asking the wrong person because I love coconut oil. Um, <laughs> so, a long, long time ago, um, we used to use, um, well, I, I was recommended uh, in my training to, that um, ladies would use olive oil because it's quite easy to get hold of. Because the problem, the problem a lot of women find is that when the vagina starts getting sore, and, they, and then they're walking normally and they get a rub, you'll have a bit of a discharge. And then a lot of ladies will then think that that's abnormal and risk of infection, etc. So then starts washing their vagina out, either with water or with water and soap. But of course, both of those are very drying. So think about your fingers when you're in the bath, they go a bit dry. So um, the first thing I would say, um, this lady obviously knows me, the first thing I would say is, you use some coconut oil for cooking because it's very natural and you use that as a soap and you use it around the outside of the vagina and inside the vagina as well. And I tend to recommend that in the morning and in the evening. And if the woman's at home to use it every time they go to pass urine, the huge advantage of coconut oil is that nobody, I've never known anybody, anybody to be allergic to it. It's a very good soap. It's a very good moisturizer because you never think about moisturizing the vagina. Whereas if you wash your face in the winter time and go out, you can feel your face cracking. And that's what happens to some women with their vaginas when they wash. And it's a very good lubricant. So as you're walking with this slightly sore vagina, you're, you're rubbing it in a much more oily and, and more lubricated way. And the other huge advantage of um, coconut oil is it's mildly antiseptic. And as Anna said about the the different types of bugs in the vagina, the lactobacillus, which keeps other infections at bay. It just helps with the acidity and, and the naturalness in the vagina. So yes, the, in answer to the question, I love coconut oil. Um, it, it, in those women who can't or won't take um, the estrogen, it's a really, really good way of keeping things at bay. Um, estrogen, as Anna said, is to me, there's very little else you can do to thicken the skin, brackets apart from the, the Mona Lisa, because Eastern is so, so well tolerated with so few risks. And it's the one thing to thicken up the skin in those women who have problems. And, and Anna and I tend to see the perimenopausal women, because I think there is a group of 
perimenopausal women who are very sensitive to the hormones going down. So when we started Mona Lisa, we were assuming that 70 and 80 year old women would come, but actually the ones with the biggest problem tend to be 45 to 60. Mm. Um, and those women, as I said, you do all these things to try to, to make it as natural as possible to make, to reduce the symptoms. So great question, coconut mm. oil. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Um, uh, Catherine says there's a nationwide shortage of um, is it estrogel and she says what would you recommend as an alternative for her HRT um, she also takes um, progesterone tablets um, yes. yes yeah I've just heard from our pharmacy that apparently the Lanzetto is a problem now estrogel back in the sales now so uh, unfortunately all these products are delivered I believe from Europe so distribution is going to be a problem one or the other one if the gel is problem spray could be used as a substitute and pharmacies are very good to swapping and switching them uh, it spray is currently as far as i'm aware became a problem gel is back in the stock so it should be all right to get off hold of gel these days but if that's a problem patch is an, another transdermal alternative all this can be switched and swapped just to um, cross cover for each other. Unfortunately, the problem is ongoing. I don't see any light at the end of that tunnel. So we'll just have to be able to use what is available. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And also, of course, it, it, there's a double whammy that um, thankfully, in, in our view, more and more women are wanting HRT. So of course, if, yeah. if you're a manufacturer of Easter gel thinking there'd be a million women, there are now three times as many um, and they haven't quite caught up with manufacturing it, as Anna said. But uh, yeah, I mean, short term, any type of Eastern HRT is, is great. Yeah, OK. I'm just going to ask a couple more questions because we're running out of time. Um, I think I'll focus on the anonymous questions and then the ones with names. We can answer you um, via email afterwards. I hope that's OK. Um, so one is a very quick one. Rowan, how many Mona Lisa treatments a year do you carry out? Um, before, so what we tend to do is um, we have, you have the treatment six weeks apart. So we have a clinic every two, it was every two weeks before COVID. It's now every three weeks. Um, and then in the last four months, we've gone back to two every two weeks. So we're treating between uh, two and 12 women at the, in each clinic. Um, so it's slightly variable um, and it's a little bit of a chop and change, but we can do up to 12. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, which one should I ask now? Um, this lady is 58 and she's been on HRT for um, almost two years. Um, many symptoms are improved, but could um, testosterone, testosterone <laughs> help with fatigue and brain fog? Anna, I guess. Uh, not necessarily. Testosterone is not recommended for those. Usually estrogen and progesterone are the ones helping those symptoms. Testosterone is mainly prescribed to support the libido. Uh, it can uh, increase metabolism because it's a male hormone to some degree, but it is not recommended for a brain fog and um, memory. It's, if estrogen is not helping cognitive function, I would prefer to have antidepressants as an alternative rather than testosterone. Okay, thank you. Um, can the Mona Lisa cause cysts, especially if someone suffers badly and regularly with these, please? Um, so I'm presuming this is vaginal cysts rather than ovarian cysts, uh, but I'll answer both. So it's completely non hormonal, so it can't do anything. Um, to the ovaries. Um, can it cause cysts in the vagina? No, um, because the process of cyst formation is, is nothing to do with this. If anything, um, so for example, if you've got a, um, a Bartholin cyst, which is the two very large cysts at the bottom of the vagina, when those become blocked, you can get large cysts forming, but the laser won't do that. Thank you. Okay, um, what are bioidentical hormones and can these do the same thing as estrogen topical cream? Thank you. Is that Prana? Yeah. They are not as effective as um, estrogen. 
the evidence now suggests uh, that they almost don't help <laughs> as such. So um, bioidentical, they are in our plants and food and all these kind of things. Uh, they should not be really used for a very long time anyway. And as I said, there's no evidence that they are being particularly helpful. So okay. alternatives are always better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to answer a couple more so we have a few more minutes. Um, this lady has, sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and um, asks if Mona Lisa would be appropriate. Um, she's 58 and was over the menopause at 43. She didn't have any HRT, but had lots of symptoms, incontinence, vaginal dryness, and painful intercourse for many years. She's newly married and embarrassed by all of this. Yeah, okay. So that goes back to what Anna was saying about the new partners. Um, Ellis Denlos is a, is a condition, um, I suppose very simply, it's a mal, malformed collagen, let's, let's say for the sake of argument. So the Mona Lisa won't make the Ellis Danlos better, but it will certainly make the vaginal skin better, just like it would in any other woman. Um, if you've got laxity, depending on what type of Ellis Danlos you've got, laxity just means very elastic tissues. Um, so there's lack of, of formation. But if you're menopausal and you've got sore, you're having sore intercourse because the skin is so thin, of course the Mona Lisa will help, but it's not going to, cure the the Ellis Danlos but I appreciate I did say that it changes collagen but it won't it won't cure the the, the Ellis Danlos at all okay but yeah I mean she should she should consider it but as I said uh, again I would use the Vagifem first the hormones in the vagina first um, and if that doesn't help with my coconut oil to then also use the uh, to think about the Mona Lisa okay thank you Hey, um, I think we've run out of time, really. So sorry we didn't answer all your questions. However, we do have all your names, so we will email you with the answers over the next um, day or so. Um, thank you very much for asking so many interesting questions. It's been a really good session. Mm. Um, and thank you both, um, Anna and Rowan, for your great answers. Um, if anyone wants to book a consultation, um, Sarah is from the private patients team, is available until 8 p.m. this evening. Um, she, um, yes, she can book you in. We are quite busy at the moment because of due to high demand. So booking you in from kind of August, in August really, August onwards. Um, you will receive a short survey at the end of this session and we'd really appreciate it if you could um, complete it. It won't take a minute or two. It just helps um, us improve for future events and um, give, give the speakers feedback as well. Our next webinar is on Tuesday, the 5th of July at 6 p.m. It's with um, Mr. Daniel Neen, and it's on shoulder replacement surgery. Um, and that's the first one we've done on shoulder replacement. So if you know anyone that would be interested in that, please do pass that on. Um, so thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, speakers. And thank you very much, everyone back at the back end of Benenden. And thank you to our, our listeners and our audience. So um, have a nice evening. We'll thank see you, you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.